So what about routing clock nets? Clock nets are very important in terms of signal integrity. A glitch on a clock net will cause an additional clock edge, as we mentioned before. Slow transitions will cause deteriorated setup hold time and registers. Flash, uh, fast transitions are strong aggressors to neighboring nets. So clock nets are really important. And therefore, what we're going to do is we're going to usually pre-route the clock nets during CTS. So we're going to do a routing stage during CTS just for the clock nets where we have first choice of all the routing tracks. None of the routing tracks are taken except for the uh, pre-routes that we did for power and so forth. Uh, second, we're going to use higher and thicker metals for clock routing because they have lower resistance and less capacitance to the substrate. It's really nice. Um, next thing, we may apply, apply clock shielding, shielding. So, for example, if we take a, a clock net here, we can put shields of VDD and ground on all sides. Usually, we're going to do it actually on um, the, the, the sides up here because we can have more interlayer dielectric up and down, and we don't necessarily have to do it on top and on bottom. And this will make sure that any signals that are routed on the sides will not be uh, disrupted or will not disrupt the clock signal. So we're going to do that actually usually only on the higher, on the bigger, higher, more major clock nets and less on the lower ones. But um, uh, that's something we're going to do. Um, next, we're going to consider adding decaps next to clock buffers. So um, for example, we have a, uh, okay, we have a clock buffer over here and we want it to behave really nicely. But of course, uh, here's the power supply somewhere and we have some sort of an R over here until it gets to the power supply. So this IR drop is not very great and we want to have a really nice clock transition. So what we can do here is add some decap over here. Uh, uh, excuse me, that's not a good picture, uh, decap over here, which provides the extra um, uh, charge to this clock buffer, even if there's a, a, a current being driven to the rest of the, the net. So what we're going to do uh, sometimes is we're going to add padding to clock buffers. So this area is going to be like a type of a blockage that can then be used to I I insert uh, decap cells. And we can do it on clock buffers. We can do it on flip-flops uh, next to the, um, the clock inputs of them. So how do we do this routing of the clock trees in uh, Cadence? Uh, what we do is in Inovus, we can define something called special routing rules. Okay, they're called non-default rules or NDRs. Uh, an example of a non-default rule is double width, double spacing. These actually are sometimes provided inside the tech left. So they're already going to have like a double width, double spacing, triple width, triple spacing type of a rule that you can use already inside the left, or we can define it as we'll see on the next slide. Okay, then we can tell Inovus to use a certain NDR by creating what's called a routing type. Okay, a routing type enables us to uh, define preferred layers and shielding. And then in Inovus, we have for clock nets, three different distinct types of clock nets. We have top clock nets. These are initial branches of the clock tree. A top net has some sort of threshold. So only clock nets that have over 10,000, I believe, um, uh, sinks to them are defined, are, are, are recognized as a top net. Next, we have trunk nets, which are the next level of nets. And if we don't have 10,000, but we still have a lot of uh, uh, fan out, these are the main branch of the crock tree. So the top nets are going to be very wide and very high. And the trunk nets are also going to be wide and high. Um, finally, we'll have the leaf nets. These are the bottom levels of the clock tree, and they should be closer to the logic because they're going to have to have, um, you know, via stacks, and there are going to be a lot more of them. So we'll put them at lower, a bit lower um, routing levels, and we may not use uh, shielding on them. So we're going to define NDRs and routing rules that apply to clock nets, such as the examples we can see over here on this slide. So first, we're going to define these NDRs. Again, they may be given in the left may be in left, so we might not need to actually define this, okay? But if we need to, what we're going to do is, for example, we're going to make a, a rule named CTS double width, double spacing to W2S. So we do it with create route rule, give it a name, and we're going to say spacing multiplier two with multiplier two. That's going to say that we are going to uh, require a DRC of double spacing and double width on uh, on nets that we give them the routing rule cts2 w2s then we're going to create a routing type so creating create routing type we're going to call it cts trunk so this is going to apply to the trunk nets okay it says which non-default rule to use well this one that we just defined here cts2 w2s then we can say listen route it in the top layer uh, m7 m6 so route it between m7 and m6 and use vss as a shield for it and uh, put that uh, underneath on M6. 
that's the type of a, uh, of a way to define that I want to um, route a certain type of net. We haven't said which nets, but if we tell a net that we want to uh, route it with the CTS trunk route rule, then it's going to have shielding in layer M6 on VSS, and it's going to be routed between M6 and M7, plus it's going to be double width, double spacing. Okay, now that we've defined this route type, we can assign this route type to certain types of nets. And for example, if we want it to be applied to all the, um, the trunk nets, we're going to say set DB CTS route tr type trunk and CTS trunk, which is the name we gave over here. So this correlates with this. This is a predefined um, uh, setting inside uh, Innovus, which says that uh, for trunk uh, uh, clock nets, uh, apply a certain route type. Okay, you can apply um, CTS trunk to any other given net as well, but for uh, trunk uh, clock nets, this is something that's built in. Okay, that may have been a bit um, confusing, but you'll have to see it inside the scripts. I just wanted to give you an overview of how it's done. Okay, how do we analyze the clock tree? So before running clock tree synthesis, we should look at each uh, clock tree and understand what the clock root is. Obviously, we need to know where it's coming from, what the desired clock uh, sinks and exceptions are, what we want to add is or remove is stop pins, ignore pins, uh, etc. Okay, whether the clock tree contains pre-existing cells such as clock gating cells, this is really going to affect us. We need to make sure that our clock propagates through our clock gating cells, maybe where the clock is sourced from and so forth. Whether the clock tree converges either with itself, a convergent clock path, or with another clock tree, an overlapping clock path, this can affect our skew balancing and so forth. Whether the clock tree has timing relationships with other clock trees in the design such as interclock skew requirements, and that can be important if we have like a divided clock and two clocks that talk to each other. What the DVR DRV can constraints are the max fan out, transition time, capacitance, maybe even max length, and we should set them in our clock tree script. And what are the library cells to use for implementing the clock tree? We should be using balanced cells for implementing it. Finally, what are the routing constraints? We have to define the routing rules and metal layers, as I showed uh, on the previous slide. So all these things we should do before starting our clock tree synthesis. So what is the tool going to do to optimize the clock tree? Let's see. It, it, say it built a clock tree uh, as so. We have this uh, 4x driver here that's divided into three nets. We have here a 3x driver, a 2x driver, and we have some logic gate, an AND gate that for some reason is over here that's 4x. And this is driving three flip-flops, this three flip-flops, this four flip-flops. What types of optimizations can the tools do? So they're pretty trivial, I would say, but it can change the sizing of the buffer over here. Let's say it can upsize it to better meet um, the skew requirements requirements okay we can size not only buffers but we can also size gates if we have uh, logic gates on here we can insert delays so we can insert some sort of uh, uh, two inverters to or two buffers to to delay the clock path that gets over to here right we can relocate the buffer so if this buffer was in a place that caused a, uh, a worse uh, type of skew we can move it and we can also move the gate over here and finally we can apply useful skew where in this case we have a long path that takes up um, 12 time units versus this takes up only eight we can add two uh, time units of uh, useful skew over to here and we uh, balance these so each of them take basically 10 time units just something I want to mention is uh, an issue that we have with post-CTS interface timing. So before CTS, of course, the clock was ideal, and we defined these I.O. constraints, set input delay and uh, uh, set output delay. Sorry, it was a mistake. Um, set output delay. And what that did is it defined kind of what we expect, the what we want the tool to um, uh, do over here and what we want the tool to do over here, assuming what kind of delay we have before and after until we get to some sort of a virtual flip-flop outside the design. Um, the problem is that after CTS, we get skew over here on the inputs. And what the skew does is, it means that we, we have this virtual flip-flop over here that gets uh, uh, virtually gets the same clock, but the skew, uh, the, the insertion delay to this guy is zero. And so what we did actually is we added skew between this input, uh, this, um, this register at the input to this virtual register that was over here. And that added positive skew on this uh, on this uh, um, uh, path, which uh, of course helps us uh, for setup timing and maybe can hurt us for hole timing. 
Um, similarly, on the out paths, we, we have skew over here. So um, what the skew means is that the clock gets over to here after some sort of delay, but our uh, virtual type of register that's over here gets us at zero. So the clock reaches this virtual output or this virtual register much later than the clock reaches this guy. And that's negative skew on our output um, path, which means that it's harder to meet our uh, requirement that we had before. Plus, it also means that uh, we might have a, a easier time fixing hold. Neither of those are good. So um, the what do we do? Um, as I mentioned, when we discuss SDCs, one of the things is just to say set max delay over here. And that uh, uh, if we do a max delay instead of an input or output delay, then um, we we get a, something that's um, that doesn't have anything to do with the skew on the clock and so forth. If we kind of know what we can do, we want to do, we can put a max delay. Um, the other thing that is done uh, currently, in at least in the cadence tools, is that they take the average insertion delay to all the pins here, and they um, add that basically to this and this flop. And if we have the average insertion delay, we kind of offer offset these skews, at least in the average, in the median case. Okay, um, so just a couple of ways that we can go and reduce some clock distribution problems, and there's a lot of research on this type of stuff. We can use latch-based design. So in latches, we have one of the phases, the latch is opaque. That means you can do what you call time borrowing, where you can borrow time from a previous stage into this one. Um, it's rarely used in fully synthesized ASICs uh, because uh, it's kind of complex, and digital designers tend to be scared of latch-based um, timing, but it is sure, for sure doable, and it can help alleviate clock uh, skew problems. Okay, we can make uh, logical uh, partitioning match physical partitioning. It limits the uh, global communication where skew is usually the worst and helps break distribution problems into smaller sub problems. We can uh, apply advanced things such as uh, GALS, globally asynchronous, locally synchronous design, where the, the design is divided into these synchronous blocks, which uh, have some low skew between them, and all the um, interfaces between them will be asynchronous interfaces. And we can use fully asynchronous design, which is um, a certain approach that has been applied often in research to try and reduce this, this whole problem of clocking.